I don't know why in recent years we as a culture seem to have come to the conclusion that any bad 3D animated film from the 2000s is great fodder for both earnest social analysis and nonsensical memory, but I for one am wholeheartedly on board with this trend. I also don't know why my roommate and I decided that once we finished our finals last spring we would watch Shark Tale to celebrate, but we did, and we did watch it, and we did become addicted to whatever subgenre that movie occupies. We watched Over the Hedge, we watched A Bug's Life, which is like an honorary DreamWorks movie, and not wanting to sink low enough to watch the B-movie, yet, we turned to Robots, the 2005 Blue Sky Studios film about robots. And it was really only upon this viewing that I realized that Robots is actually a really explicit damning of the entire healthcare system of the United States. I believe it was Big Joel who said that while a lot of Disney and Pixar films focus on the journeys of individuals, DreamWorks films often center around an individual's place in society. They focus on systemic issues, whereas almost all Disney movies are about discovering one's own identity. Add in the fact that Disney Pixar is, like, a good studio, and this can almost make those films too boringly competent to analyze in the YouTube video format. Sure, you can critique them on their own level, you know, like a film, but since almost all of their implications and meanings are intentional, you can only do so much. But DreamWorks films, and also Blue Sky, are far from boring and often far from competent. There's something so crunchy about this era of DreamWorks movies, like they're filled with all these secret meanings and political implications. And I like DreamWorks' newer stuff too, Kung Fu Panda and How to Train Your Dragon, but I like them in the way I like a competent film. These hot messes have so many ideas, they bite off so much more than they can chew, and sometimes they even raise questions that the filmmakers themselves may not have intended to bring up. There is not a better example of this than 2005's Robots. He's talking to me, Dad. He sure is something. I don't deign to believe that anybody other than me has seen robots in the last 15 years, so here is a brief recounting of the film's events. Rodney Copperbottom is a robot from a modest family in a small town who grew up with dreams of becoming a successful inventor. His dreams largely came from watching the famous industrialist and philanthropist Big Weld on his TV show, which showcases the inventions of various regular citizens who come by Big Weld Industries to present their creations and possibly be hired at the company, promoting the ideals of progress and innovation in the process. Rodney eventually decides to take his own invention, the Wonderbot, and make his way to Robot City, which I guess passed for a really creative and whimsical name in 2005 when only like 10 3D animated films existed, and he shares his idea with Big Weld himself. His plans are ruined, however, when he realizes that Big Weld has been pushed out of his role as head of the company, and they are no longer allowing regular people to walk in and share their ideas. In Big Weld's place is this guy, Phineas T. Ratchet, who is openly evil. I can't stress this enough, he is like explicitly evil in ways that you don't typically see in animated films these days, even ones made for kids. So I don't want to hear another, Where's Big Weld? Wait! We'll see him next month at the Big Weld Ball! He is totally against the idea of letting regular people into the company and is also against the company even catering to the needs of real people at all. Hello! Memo to Big Weld! We're not a charity! See, the company previously sold spare parts for robots and was aimed at serving the needs of all the people. Villain Man is of course against wasting any resources or time selling goods to those with little money to spend on them, and so makes the decision that Big Weld Industries will focus only on marketing expensive upgrades to rich robots and no longer produce any spare parts. Keep in mind, this appears to be the only company in the universe of the movie to produce parts for robots, so this corporate decision has the effect of sentencing all robots to a premature death by refusing them replacements for the broken down parts that they need to survive. Ratchet's mother, this, is the leader of the Chop Shop, a slave labor dungeon where random scraps and sometimes entire sentient beings are chopped into bits and boiled down to be used in new products. Evil Woman is largely the source of Villain Man's most heinous plans for commercial domination and the extermination of the poor, and I do mean extermination. They are not just passively allowing the poor and sick to die by denying them spare parts, they also support essentially kidnapping poors from the streets and sending them down to the chop shop. This is where the themes of classism and corporate greed are most explicitly articulated. Having been ejected from Big World Industries, Rodney stays with the Robin Williams voiced robot Fender, whose personality and name are definitely not inspired by Bender from Futurama, and even if it was, who cares, it's another Fox property and you can't steal from yourself. 
and Fender's found family, which includes Aunt Fanny, who has a big butt, and Piper, who is a girl. While staying with these impoverished robots, most of whom are breaking down, Rodney uses his talent for fixing broken things to help all of the needy citizens of the city for free, although the new shortage of spare parts means that most robots are destined to die very soon anyways. Rodney and Fender decide to sneak into an event hosted by Big Weld Industries to speak to the man himself, but Rodney's enraged when Ratchet announces that Big Weld will not be appearing that night. Ratchet then just straight up orders security to kill Rodney and Fender? Take him for a drive and bring me back his exact weight in paper clips. And the two only escape because another robot at the company, Cappy, decides to help them. Rodney and Cappy travel to see Big Weld in his isolated mansion to explain what is going on and try to get him to help, but Big Weld is disillusioned, explaining that corporate greed embodied by Ratchet overpowered his ideals of innovation and helping people in need, and there's nothing he can do to stop it. He sends the two of them away. Meanwhile, Fender ends up being kidnapped by the anti-poor machine and sent to the chop shop. He's able to escape, but first learns that Ratchet and Gasket are planning on using these new machines to pick up all the outmoded robots from the entire city and take them to the chop shop to get melted down and sold as new products. This would then both make the company more money and take care of the issue of poor disabled people existing in society. Oh, by the way, I found out who's been fixing those outmodes. So starting tomorrow, these babies are going to chop him up along with all his broken down buddies and every other walking pile of junk I'm sick of looking at. Fender comes back and explains what he heard to Rodney, Cappy, and the others. Big Will changes his mind about whether it's worth it to fight genocide and returns to his company with the others. He tries to fire Ratchet, but Ratchet knocks him unconscious and plans to murder him. Rodney rallies his friends and all the other outmodes in the city that he's repaired to invade the chop shop, free Big Weld, and defeat Ratchet and Gasket. Eventually, Gasket is burned to death in an incinerator and Ratchet is hanged. <laughs> Big Weld becomes the head of his company once again promises to continue producing spare parts for all robots, and finally gives Rodney a job. So, let's start with the obvious. Robots clearly contains themes of classism and elitism that were almost definitely deliberate. The concept of discrimination against older and broken down robots also could or could not have been a purposeful allegory for real life ableism. But the movie does more than condemn overt interpersonal prejudice against the world's version of the poor and sick, it also takes aim at the structural forces that keep them marginalized. To explain, let's break down our actors here. First, we have Big Weld Industries. This is seemingly the largest corporation that exists and the most powerful force in the everyday lives of Robot City residents, possibly all citizens in the entire world of the film. Its role is to create and provide parts for robots, making it the largest supplier of healthcare in the world. Note that there is an instance where Rodney's father is treated by some kind of visiting doctor in his hometown, so there might be other healthcare providers out there, but their impact is severely limited. This is even demonstrated in the case of Rodney's father, who is unable to recover from his chronic illness without an expensive part from Big Weld Industries. In this world, in order for him to live, A, Big Weld Industries needs to produce this part, and B, he needs to be able to afford it. The next actor we have is Ratchet and his mother, Mama Gasket. They are upper crust capitalists who hate the poor as much as they love money and power. You know what I call robots who can't afford upgrades? Scrap metal. You see them on the streets, misshapen. Rust covered. They turn your insides out. You want to run home and scrub yourself. They are clearly exaggerated, and I will get into the differences between these characters and the actual billionaire oligarchs of our society later, but they are clearly meant to represent corporate greed and exemplify how this greed can overpower any sense of decency or compassion. We have the regular citizens of Robot City. These include Rodney's new friends, as well as all the robots whose ailments he treats. It is also critical to note that some of these citizens seem poor or working class, but many could be solidly middle class. Take this scene as evidence, where we see the upgrades that Big Weld Industries is trying to sell in place of all the spare parts. Do these seem like they're affordable? The company's consumer base is clearly the richest citizens, maybe the upper middle class and above. There's also this scene in the boardroom where Ratchet says something to the effect of, Let's get back to sucking every last dime out of Mr. and Mrs. Average Robot. Let's get down to the business of sucking every loose penny out of Mr. and Mrs. Average Knucklehead. So apparently they are trying to market this to the average middle class family and not just the rich. 
but there is a clear difference between the ultra rich spending money on things that they don't need and still being worth millions or billions and the middle class literally having every last dime sucked out of them in order to survive. If you have to empty your bank account or sell every last asset you have to pay for something, you can't really afford it. In our world, this manifests as regular people going into debt to pay for necessary care and others forgoing healthcare entirely. Likewise, I would not be surprised if some of the robots who presented to Rodney to get fixed up are middle class people who would do anything to avoid caving to the demands of big world industries and spending all that they have for expensive upgrades that they don't need just because they aren't allowed the cheap parts that would actually help them. I can't afford that fancy stuff. All I need is one stinking neck joint. No. Then there's Big Weld, and this is where things start to get complicated. Big Weld is a capitalist, a true captain of industry, and he is extremely absurdly wealthy, evidenced by the fact that he lives in this gigantic secluded mansion and is the founder of the largest company in the world. But he's different from Ratchet in every other meaningful way. While Ratchet is greedy, Big Weld is magnanimous. Big Weld's slogan is, you can shine no matter what you're made out of. Ratchet's is, why be you when you can be new? Perhaps most importantly, Big Weld seems to have run his company out of some combination of wanting to help robots in need and a love for innovation and technology, as compared to Ratchet, who prioritized profits and also has a side quest wherein he's trying to genocide all the poors. Let's put a pin in the entire character of Big Weld for now. Lastly, we absolutely have to mention what is missing in the story, the state. There is absolutely no depiction or suggestion of any kind of government in this film's world at all. There is nothing. There is no public healthcare system or regulation of the private healthcare sector. If you're a robot in need of fixing, you better hope that the seemingly only healthcare company will treat you and that you can afford it. There are no police, only the private security forces of corporations. If a company decides to execute you, then they just will, and no one is going to stop them. Instead of cops or a court system or even a military force, there are sweepers, Vehicles created by Big Weld Industries to roam the streets looking for the poor, disabled robots to kidnap and harvest. There is seemingly some kind of transportation system, but it was difficult to determine whether this was publicly funded or the product of a company. It definitely does not look government regulated, though. Robot City is essentially a lawless anarcho-capitalist haven for corporations and the ultra-rich. The Society of Robots is obviously not a literal one-to-one -one depiction of ours. We do still have a government, we definitely have a police force, and we don't let corporations kidnap individuals off of the street to be chopped alive into bits and melted down for fuel. I mean, not generally. But we do have sweatshops, workers are forced to work in dangerous conditions for long hours and are paid starvation wages, sometimes illegally due to poor enforcement of labor laws, but far more commonly in ways that are totally legal. We have corporations so powerful that they rival the influence of the government and definitely have billionaires with more power than our elected officials. We have poor individuals who systematically face fewer opportunities in our society with regards to education, employment, and social mobility. We have individuals so poor that they need to sleep on the streets or ask strangers for money. People who look so poor and dirty that the middle class and rich choose to criminalize their poverty to avoid having to look at them because looking at them literally disgusts them. We have disabled people who are often cast as burdens to society, very often because their disability limits the kind of work that they can do and thus their usefulness to the society's economy. And we absolutely have poor people getting sick and dying at disproportionate rates due to illnesses that are completely treatable if you have the money. So let's talk about the US healthcare system. You may have heard that the United States spends more money on its healthcare than any other country. Many are surprised by or flat out incredulous of this fact, given that our healthcare is privatized, and one of the main or really only arguments against any expansion of government funded health insurance is how will we pay for it? This statement is strictly speaking true, both in terms of percentage of our GDP and per capita in US dollars once adjusted for purchasing power, and we are number one by far in that respect. This graph here is actually slightly out of date. According to the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, in 2020, U.S. healthcare spending grew 9.7%, reaching $4.1 trillion in total, or $12,530 per capita, 19.7% of our total GDP. And note that the government only contributes about 45% of this through programs like Medicare and Medicaid, and an additional 7% through much smaller sources of government spending and third-party resources, 
such as the Veterans Administration, the National Indian Health Services, and Workers' Comp. This means that 48% is coming from private employers or directly out of the pockets of Americans. Yet our healthcare markers are some of the worst among high-income countries, and we are the richest out of all of them. With regards to life expectancy, rates of type 2 diabetes and cancers, infant mortality rates, maternal mortality rates, and more, we are far behind. And perhaps worst of all, as of 2021, more than 8% of Americans were without any kind of health insurance, according to U.S. Census data. This phenomenon of pay more, get less is explained thoroughly by the late economist Uwe Reinhardt in his book Priced Out. But there is more to this story. The book The American Healthcare Paradox by Elizabeth Bradley adds some context to this widely disseminated observation. The United States is spending an extraordinary amount on healthcare as narrowly defined by the OECD. Total health expenditures in Sweden, Denmark, and Norway were 11.8, 10.1, and 8.9% of the GDP, respectively, whereas health spending comprised 16.3% of the U.S. GDP in 2007. But importantly, these figures do not factor in government spending on areas that have indirect effects on health, like nutrition, housing, education, the environment, unemployment support, child allowances for families with children, pensions, and other social programs leading to improved welfare. As Bradley writes, The United States is not spending as much as other industrialized countries on fortifying crucial social services that help make people healthy. The houses and neighborhoods people live in, the food people eat, the air people breathe, the amount of exercise people get, and the jobs people have all influence their health. Man, that's a lot of spending. When you factor in all of those areas, they must make up almost all of a government's budget. I mean, look at our country's budget this year. We spend the vast majority on health and social security. But that's mandatory spending, funding we decided to allocate a while ago. Let's look at discretionary spending, the money that Congress votes to spend each additional year. This should show us where our current priorities truly lie. Oh. If we are to look not just at government spending, but U.S. spending in general, we spend less than 10% on all social services. This is less than France, Sweden, Austria, Switzerland, Denmark, and Italy, which all spend around 20%. This is called the healthcare paradox, but it really shouldn't be all that surprising that among middle and high income countries, those that spend the most on medical care have the poorest health. When you think about it, medical care itself is the treatment for health issues that have progressed to the point where you need medical interventions. Obviously, there are exceptions reproductive and maternal health care, routine vaccinations, etc. But the majority of medical care, and the most expensive, is provided to the most sick. On an individual basis, the majority of healthcare spending in the United States is spent by a minority of citizens, the sickest, the chronically ill, those that need to come back again and again for more care. So spending on healthcare is not a preventative measure to protect a nation's health. It is an indication that the nation is in poor health. What's something else that shouldn't be surprising? That allowing private companies to make money off of the health and sickness of the public was a bad idea. A central question of Reinhardt's book is, is healthcare a luxury that can be bought and sold, or is it a public good that all individuals should be entitled to? In our system, where insurance is sometimes provided through public programs, but usually through private ones, and where medical care is almost always delivered by private entities, it is pretty clear how we see this issue. We see healthcare as a good or a service, something to make money off of. And boy, do we make money off of it. The private health insurance market has since grown exponentially from a $1 billion industry in 1950 to an $8.7 billion industry in 1965 and to an $848.7 billion industry in 2010. It just follows that this creates a conflict of interests when healthcare providers are trying to treat their patients the best that they can, but also trying to get money from them. Our fee-for-service model is the ultimate example of that. Doctors and hospitals are incentivized to perform as many tests and procedures as they reasonably can justify because they will be reimbursed for each service that they perform, and reimbursement means money in your pocket. As we can see, there are consequences when we see healthcare, and thus health itself, as a luxury good and see patients as customers. Shannon Brownlee sums it up pretty well in the documentary Escape Fire. We have a disease care system, and we have a very profitable disease care system. And the disease care system actually... I mean, if, if it really was honest with itself, it doesn't want you to die and it doesn't want you to get well. It just wants you to keep coming back for your care of your chronic disease. The U.S. has the highest quality medical care that you can access in terms of technology, facilities, and skilled personnel. 
We have the most advanced technology, the best hospitals, and honestly, some of the best trained and most talented specialist doctors and advanced practice nurses in the world. We are also the country that spends the most money on this care, readily shelling out billions of dollars for expensive surgeries like cardiac bypass, hip and knee replacements, and organ transplants, million dollar MRI machines, and oceans of expensive prescription drugs. We're a country that often treats health like a status symbol that associates thinness and a lack of illness or disability with wealth, whiteness, and moral fiber. And we are a country where if circumstances result in you becoming injured or ill, your ability to pay directly determines your ability to recover. What is the Society of Robots? One where individuals shell out huge sums of money for life-saving spare parts as well as expensive upgrades to boost their status in society. One where the shinier and fancier you look, the richer and thus more valuable to society you must be. One where if you get injured or just start to break down as a natural part of the aging process, you must buy yourself more life. And if you can't afford it, the system will literally kill you. It's all right, son. You can shine no matter what oh, shift. Yes. Stop! I could go on a long tangent about satire and allegory and coding and whether an author's intent in creating a world matters to how we interpret it or the lessons that we take away, but there are at least a hundred video essays about death of the author on YouTube right now, so I won't get into that. Instead, I'll jump to my conclusion on the subject. In this instance, I don't really care about the intent of the filmmakers. They probably didn't mean for this to be a scathing send-up of our healthcare system, or I mean maybe they did. Maybe these writers and producers and Chris Wedge, director of Ice Age and Monster Trucks, are more based than we thought. But no, I don't think it matters whether it was intentional. To me, the fact that the writers probably didn't intend this to be a portrayal of our healthcare system makes the solutions that they end up proposing more interesting, because they expose the unconscious biases that we have when it comes to capitalism and society. At this point, I feel we all understand the problems that the film Robots has presented, but what are its solutions? If you understand the fundamental flaws of the US healthcare system, you probably see the conflicts of interest proposed by bringing capitalism into the equation, by seeing healthcare as a luxury as opposed to a public good or a right. And Robots does seem to agree with half of that statement. The movie understands that healthcare should not be a luxury. It understands that healthcare is something that all individuals need and that society suffers when the average Joe robot is left to die by a system that prioritizes profits over all else. However, it does not see the problem posed by bringing private interest into the equation. It argues that you can have a company making money off of the health and sickness of the people while still serving the needs of the people. In order to understand how Robots makes this argument, we need to talk about how this movie portrays the rich, and not just the upper class in general, but the richest of the rich. Let's start with Big Weld. This guy is the picture of the benevolent billionaire philanthropist. He's kind of quirky, doesn't play by the rules of the system, and loves the people. He's an egalitarian who holds no prejudice for those less wealthy than him, and in fact actively seeks out their perspectives. He also seems to be a capitalist kind of by accident. There is never a hint that Big Weld ever wanted to be rich or powerful. Rather, he just loves innovation and created his company to pursue this. Somewhere along the way, he just happened to turn it into one of the most profitable corporations in the world that single-handedly is responsible for treating the medical needs of the most populous city, if not the entire world. In contrast, we have Ratchet, a guy defined by his hatred of the poor and his love for money and power. Nothing is subtle about Ratchet. He openly expresses his contempt for the poor, sick, and disabled, talking about them like vermin that need to be exterminated, and he and his mother do literally want them to be exterminated. Ratchet runs Big Weld Industries like a dictator and wants to wipe away Big Weld's legacy to focus solely on profits, something that is not dressed up in any kind of euphemistic language or insinuation. What this movie gets right about our society is that it is controlled by a very small number of ultra-rich capitalists, and while plenty of them are as bad as Ratchet, even the ones who are will not be caught dead admitting to it. They will always dress up their disdain for the poor, and even paint themselves as virtuous through their philanthropic activities or the vague idea of creating jobs. You can trace this behavior back to the robber barons of the turn of the century. It has always been the case. Never in history has a billionaire as innately good as Big Weld existed, nor one as openly evil as Ratchet. It's interesting where this movie finds flaws in the rich. Ambition is a virtue, but greed is a sin. Being rich is neutral, but wanting to be rich is bad. A company essentially controlling the lives of every citizen in a city, holding their very lives in its hands, is fine as long as it makes the right decisions. But name the city after that company, Ratchet City! And now we've gone too far. 
In the end, this is the most disappointing part about robots. It buys completely into the myth of the magnanimous billionaire, the idea that the rich are the source of our problems but also our only chance of being saved. Elements of class solidarity and even class uprising are present. The movie even pretty much states that without the working class, overthrowing Ratchet would be impossible. But without Big Weld and his company, there would be no hope for the future of these robots. Yeah, Rodney was doing his best to help the broken down robots who came to him for tune-ups, but he couldn't serve all those people. And honestly, this is a pretty accurate point about systemic issues. We can't rely on a few do-gooders to save the day by working around the system. We need to tear down and rebuild the system. Similarly, we can't rely on nonprofit organizations or for-profit companies. In the case of nonprofits, they will just never be large and competent enough to make up for a broken system. And in the case of for-profits, they will just never choose to do that. And if they say that they want to, do not trust them, they're lying. If a service is being provided by a company or a charity or a single individual, then it's not a right, it's not protected, and it can't be guaranteed. The only real solution to the problem of robots would be to have the state step in and either require Big World Industries to continue producing spare parts by law for free, or to have the state start producing spare parts themselves. But guess what? The world of robots doesn't have a state, so that's not an option. A satisfying conclusion, the one that would be most applicable to real life, is therefore impossible. By the end of the film, the status quo has been preserved. Big Weld is back in control of Big Weld Industries, the company is still a for-profit and certainly isn't democratized in any way, the city is still named Robot City, the poors are still poor, and the rich are still rich. But the poor and disabled aren't being eaten by Zambonis anymore, and everyone seems to get along. And that's the only change that was ever on the table, everyone just being nicer to each other. We don't want to accidentally propose socialized health because it's 2005 and that's considered a radical idea in the United States. We don't want to overthrow capitalism. The movie studio itself is capitalism. It's pretty typical for films to shy away from radical change and end up returning to the status quo. It's even more noticeable in animated films for kids because they tend to rely heavily on analogy, allegory, and coding. Part of me wants to think that this is primarily because of what I was saying, that films are inherently a product of capitalism and filmmakers are hesitant to upset the system that employs them, or maybe that explicitly political messages are just considered a faux pas in most films unless they're the most lukewarm, anodyne takes like, we shouldn't discriminate against minority groups, or genocide is bad. And I think all of these things do contribute. At the same time though, I think psychologically speaking, we as humans are just scared of change, even when we know it's necessary change, and even when it's a fictional story. It's pretty common in animated kids films to start off with everything basically being fine. Then something happens to disrupt the piece, the characters have to solve the problem, they learn lessons along the way, and then by the end things are pretty close to how they started, except that Marlon trusts Nemo more or Jason Bateman is a cop now. Or Rodney gets a job. Even the ending of Shrek, which consists of the king being overthrown, doesn't lead to much societal change. They mainly just stop Farquaad's evil plan to place all of the fairy tale creatures in concentration camps, which had only just begun. This is the case in a lot of these movies. The job of the protagonist is to avoid or reverse the change to the status quo, not to affect change themselves. When I started thinking about this movie, I had one question on my mind. If Robots is a film that exposes the flaws with capitalized healthcare, does it end with the abolishment of such a system? The answer is very clear. No, it absolutely does not. But it exposes them nonetheless. The god-awful healthcare system portrayed in Robots is not a satire of our system or a warning of what's to come. It is our current system. The private healthcare sector, be they insurers, pharmaceutical companies, or for-profit health centers, probably want to see themselves as big world. But I would hope that if prompted to think about this movie a little more deeply, most viewers would recognize them as Ratchet. I would hope that even if they don't get on board with socializing medicine, they would agree that the industry needs a reorganizing of priorities. I hope that most Americans would agree that the health of our population matters more than the wealth of a few. And from this point, maybe we'd agree that it is a little bit of a conflict of interest to promote health while profiting off of illness. Once we realize that capitalism is incompatible with an effective, honest, and just healthcare system, we are on a road that really only ends with one conclusion. We are doing everything wrong.
and death. That was about robots. It is. <laughs> Jesus. The god-awful healthcare system portrayed in Roblox, Roblox 